Father, thou source of all mercy and grace, when we reflect on the fact that it's our sin which has elicited thy mercy and revealed a characteristic in thee that apart from sin and guilt would never have been known, we do rejoice, therefore, that there has been a fall of man in spite of all its iniquity because that has been the occasion for the rise of God to display the splendor and incredible depth of his infinite compassion. We thank thee that we have been the recipients of it and that it has been sovereign in its display as thou hast insisted that thou wilt have mercy on whom thou wilt have mercy. And we know that we have no claim on mercy and that inasmuch as it has come triumphantly into our heart even as Christ entered humbly but triumphantly into Jerusalem, a decadent and depraved city. So the glory is to him, the shame is to us, and we shall celebrate for all eternity the fact that he loved us when there was nothing lovely in us, when there was everything unlovely in us, and that there was in us nothing but what elicited his hatred and wrath and apart from the intercessory blood of his son Jesus would have brought us the eternal wages of that dreadful sin. But we celebrate this morning the compassion of God for those whom he has chosen to show that saving compassion. And we bow at the same time before the sovereignty which has decided not to show it to everyone and thus we are persuaded in the depths of our being how incredibly fortunate we are and that all the love which flows in our hearts now is because the Holy Spirit has been shed sovereignly abroad in those hearts. And as we ponder the ways of God in this class, help us not only to be grateful for our own good fortune, but to recognize ourselves as thy agents in the spread of the gospel beginning in Wichita so that others who have been appointed to this wondrous and unspeakable privilege may by our instrumentality as brands snatched from the burning be brought also into the wondrous redeeming love of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Now before we take a moment or two to see what you doers of theology have, uh, have done, let me simply mention that change in location which will be the car a permanent place of our meeting throughout uh, my career here for this evening class as far as that's concerned. I've been begging for any kind of a room which we could call our own, even if it was a furnace room, for three years, and now I've finally persuaded the establishment that we better have one. So that's it, room 111, and from here on out, if you're free on a Sunday night, except next Sunday night from 7 to 9, come down and study with us the great themes of uh, grace. I mentioned to you several times about this subject of our class here this morning, For Whom Christ Died, that it's a minority report in our time and that the problem which was beginning to emerge uh, noticeably in the 17th century and had this classic refutation by John uh, Owen is uh, the overwhelming majority report of our time. I've mentioned to you on a occasion, I think the first time we had the class, uh, about this particular book, for example, which was published in 1975, Grace Unlimited. It's edited by Clark Pinnock, who at one time I thought might be the B.B. Warfield of the second half of the 20th century. He's certainly one of the finest minds in the evangelical world, and at that time he was as staunch a reform man as we had, but he unfortunately has fallen from that uh, position. God's Universal Salvific Grace is a chapter by Vernon Grounds, who many of you know, and so it goes. Donald Lake, Jack Cottrell, William MacDonald, David Klein, Howard Marshall, a famous uh, writer on the New Testament, 
Grant Osborne, again well known, and the, it might interest you that the very last article in this symposium is a Puritan in a post-Puritan world, Jonathan Edwards, in which James D. Strauss, a very learned scholar, tries to um, refute Edwards's classic uh, defense of this position. But this is just a, a scholarly reminder of the fact that uh, what, as I say, in popular evangelism on radio and TV is almost universally advocating the doctrine that Jesus Christ died with a specific intention of saving every lost uh, sinner. And though the going is hard in this uh, Owen work, I may say, incidentally, though I probably ought not to do it on, on this particular Sunday when you're making pledges for the next five years for the church building, but the 16 uh, volumes of John Owen's works, are, uh, which usually sell for $215, are now on sale for $99.95. I get a kick out of the way these evangelicals can go as professionally business-like as anybody else when it comes to that 95 cents and 99 cents. But if any of you ever want to a, a, make a major investment, uh, that $100 would be extremely well spent as soon as you built your building at any rate. And uh, the type of theology you have here is utterly typical of uh, John Owen. He's, he's just one of the finest Reformed the theologians the church has ever, has ever had. At the same time, this is utterly typical of him. You won't get any easy reading in John uh, Owen. It's all close grain. As I say, my job here is to translate his English into contemporary English or American at, uh, at uh, any rate. But if you're willing to put forth the effort, you're digging for real gold, and unlike some of your efforts for gushers, you can be sure the gusher will be here. As a matter of fact, it'll be overflowing uh, to you. But at the same time... Uh, you have other things on your mind right now. Now, the two points we want to look at this morning before we move after the Easter uh, recess from uh, adult classes to um, um, these uh, 18 proofs that he has for the sixth point, which is a more or less general point, but the two he has today, let me read the first one and see if any of you have done any reflecting during the week that you would like to offer before you have read uh, Owen. It's on page six of the document that you uh, have. That which the scripture so sets forth in general for the world of mankind as a truth for them all, that whosoever of the particulars so believe as to come into Christ and receive the same shall not perish but have everlasting life, is certainly a truth to be believed, Acts 5.20. But that God sent forth his Son to be the Savior of the world is in Scripture to set forth in general for all men that whosoever of the particular individuals, that is, so believe, as they come into Christ and receive the same, they shall not perish but have everlasting life. And then he cites John 3.16 and other verses there. Therefore, Thomas More concludes, that God sent his Son to be the Savior of the world is a certain truth. First John 4. 14. That's his proof that Jesus Christ died for everyone. Now, any of you, your reflections on that? Uh, okay. okay, the, the phrase in my key on is called the truth for all. Obviously, yeah. what, what Christ is saying is the truth. Uh, one, no one, dispute on that. You no can understand that. that. Yeah. Uh, what it, I was looking at is when Christ was asked why he spoke in parables, it, it seems almost terribly inconsistent with what the, what they probably have I, I talk, talk in parables so that I can conceal the truth, so that people can't see it, so that they can come, they can understand, be, uh, repent, and be forgiven, which seems an antithesis of a truth for all. It seems like he's hiding the truth from some people. In other words, when you read that passage, you uh, hear where uh, he was, uh, where Thomas More was arguing that Jesus Christ died to save everyone. The first thing that apparently that uh, came into Rich Blinn's mind was. There were certainly occasions in our Lord's life when so far from being anxious to save everybody, he seems actually intending to uh, keep the way of salvation from, uh, from people. I think you're all familiar with that uh, description of our Lord about the parables when the disciples asked him why he used parables, which we think are quite fascinating and, of course, intriguing and interest-getting and attention-holding and all that sort of thing, but they're nevertheless very baffling. And the people who were closest to him recognized that. And when they raised the question about Jesus, don't you realize you hadn't had a good course in pedagogy if you used something like this? It tended to be confusing. And Jesus is virtually saying, 
I intended to be that way. Any other comments from any of you about this argument of, uh, of Thomas More's uh, for the fact that Jesus Christ died? I keep re reminding you because I want this to come into your consciousness. This is being said as axiomatic these days. The only difference between this uh, for example, that we're going through, and this book here, even though it's by some very able scholars and there's a very good deal of evidence of, uh, of learning in it, at the same time it's trifling alongside of this debate of the 17th century. This, this whole book, I, I shouldn't say that because I haven't read everything in it, but I think I can safely conclude on the basis of what I have read in it and so on, that this book doesn't begin to get in to the depth of the argument the way this 17th century debate actually did, though the arguments are essentially uh, the same. But any other comments that you got out of reading this before you looked at Owen yourself? Now, we'll look at it more detailedly later on, but let's go on to the fifth argument because that's on our agenda for today also. That which God will one day cause every man confess to, confess to the glory of God is certainly a truth, for God will own no lie for his glory, John 13, 3, 9, Romans 3, 3, and 4. But God will one day cause every man to confess Jesus by virtue of his death and ransom given to be the Lord, even to the glory of God, Philippians 2, etc. Therefore it is certainly a truth that Jesus Christ hath given himself a ransom for all men, and hath thereby the right of leadership over them. And if any will not believe and come into this government, yet he, ab he Christ, abideth faithful and cannot deny himself, but will one day bring them before him and cause them to confess him, Lord, to the glory of God when they shall be denied by him for denying him in the days of his patience, Second Timothy 2, etc. Any besides Rich Blind done any homework on that and any reflections on that uh, argument? You know what I want you to do. You don't have to speak in class, but I hope you will always read this material. Give uh, Thomas More full weight. Look at the scripture if you don't already know them and so on and see what you would do uh, with the apparently sound argument that Jesus Christ died for everybody, which he gives uh, here. And then if you want to volunteer it here, for your, uh, I'd be glad to receive it. Any other comments uh, from you? Very well, let's get down to my translating of him into more uh, elementary type of, uh, of English here. This first, uh, uh, and as I say, next week we have no class. And when we come back again, we have about six Sunday mornings, so we have roughly three of his proofs of a major position that he enunciates in six, which is fundamentally what he's been enunciating all along. But it's a listing of some 18 proofs, and we'll look at three of them each morning, and I hope that you will look at them on your own. And whether you choose to mention it publicly or not, that you will see if you can answer these things yourself. Remember when the question comes up, and I'll just a thing I was going to ask you, I think I mentioned last week. How many of you listening to TV ra uh, religious broadcasts or radio broadcasts or tapes or whatever during the past week, have been, if you've been sensitive at, at all to this point, uh, have any of you or how many of you have heard on some broadcast of some sort or another uh, a, a pro the, the idea that Jesus Christ died to save each and every individual? Yeah, about a dozen of you have raised hands. That means that doesn't mean the others the others of you haven't heard it. You may not have been listening. The others of you may not have been listening to TV programs or, or radio. But have uh, I'll ask this question then, especially of the dozen who did uh, answer, but for all of you. Did any of you, in listening to radio or TV broadcasts this past week on this subject, hear John Owen's position that Jesus Christ died to save the elect, and that, whether that language was used, but to save those to whom God had given him? Did any of you ever hear that? I should have fall over if you did, as a matter of fact. I mean, uh, my pessimism shouldn't uh, prevail too much there, but it is, we're in a very sad day this way. This is, a, as I said at the very beginning, it's a cardinal doctrine. This isn't a peripheral matter. I hear Bible schools pulled apart because they differ on whether there's a pre-tribulation rapture, a mid-tribulation rapture, or a post-tribulation rapture, a trivia among trivia, and so on. And here something like this goes, and there's no real concern about it. Very, very uh, lamentable situation in which we find ourselves. But let's look at this fourth uh, argument which, um, which uh, um, he's giving us. And by the way, I, I got a question from some members of the class concerning God's concern for the rest of the world. And I'm going to reserve that to the end of the class. But I'd like to get through these two arguments uh, uh, first of uh, all. What uh, Owen is saying here is that uh, whoever in the world... This is his first proposition, but I'll put it in my own language. 
whoever in the world. By the way, watch these little archaisms, you know, that uh, whosoever that you'll find in the King James Version, you'll find in Owen and so on. That's good form in the 17th century, but bad, obsolete form in the 20th century to watch that thing. I'd like to get you back to old-fashioned theology, but not old-fashioned archaic phraseology, so try to be careful. I think I told you about a minister who was so inured with the past that he let forth a forsooth in his sermon one morning and so there's certain things you can't you can't do you shakespeareans and king james specialists and linguistic experts and so on watch that uh, type of thing get it keep the old arguments but watch the old phraseology but whoever believes whoever in the world whoever in world believes will be saved that's proposition number one and there's no argument about it i gather no one would question that uh, I, I think here that you'd have to be virtually liberal or secular to uh, and repudiating the Christian faith in general. I mean, this is fundamental to the faith that, um, that faith in Christ is the way to be saved. But this general proposition is the first one, and uh, Christ came to save all in the world who believe. First, the general proposition. It's a perishing world, and the way of, of salvation is through faith. And Jesus Christ came particularly to provide the object for that faith by which we shall be saved. Again, no dispute. Everybody would recognize that who's evangelical and believes the Bible, I take it. Any question about the actual meaning? The phraseology is different, but I think the argument uh, is the same. If you ever think I have uh, been unfair to Moore in my restatement of the argument, I try to simplify the uh, thing, but in the process of it, I alter it in your opinion don't hesitate to say so now here's where here's where uh, he comes to the conclusion which owen uh, uh, rejects and i do i think the bible does and so on is this therefore this is the conclusion see this is an argument and so on therefore christ came to save everyone in the world Uh, whether you read it at home or not, uh, you, you'll see this right away. <laughs> that doesn't follow at all. That's what we call a non sequitur. It's something which doesn't follow. It's supposed to follow. This and that is supposed to lead to this particular conclusion. But I think if any of you uh, reading that or following this and so on pay uh, half attention to it, you'll realize he slipped in the uh, debated point at the very uh, beginning. All that would follow from this statement, and you'd think Thomas More would see that, is that if it's true that whoever in the world believes will be saved, and that Christ came to save all in the world who uh, believe, uh, uh, to save all in the world who believe, Christ came to save everyone in the, every believer in the world. Christ came to save believers. Not everybody in the world. That's exactly the opposite. To save certain persons in the world, and those certain persons in the world are believers. And since Moore and Owen and everybody would agree with the proposition that not everybody in the world is a believer, that's the heresy of universal salvation. See, the heresy that we're dealing with here is the universal design of salvation. But even the Arminians who hold that heresy nevertheless never draw the conclusion that because Christ tried to save everybody, he succeeded in it. As soon as anybody says he succeeded in it, then, of course, he's gone right clean out of biblical orbit, and he recognizes it, and I won't do it. But you see, you immediately see the problem I pointed out time and again. If Jesus Christ did come with the purpose of saving everybody in the world, what in the world prevented him? If salvation is by grace, and he changes people's heart, and his spirit is sovereign in the way, what in the world would stop him? But right now, that's not the argument, you understand. That's just something you say as an aside, somewhat the way Rich did. When he read that particular statement about Jesus Christ coming to save everybody, he immediately thinks of the fact that Jesus Christ was obviously trying to hide something from some people. As a matter of it's a, sh it's a shocker, you see, that way. But strictly speaking, as far as the argument is concerned, this is a non sequitur. He's saying two general statements, namely that whoever in the world will be saved, uh, uh, whoever in the world will believe will be saved, and that Jesus Christ came to save everybody in the world who would believe. And then he draws from that the conclusion that Jesus Christ came to save everybody in the world. Said utter non sequitur. He came to save every believer in the 
uh, in the world is actually what the argument of uh, Thomas More would actually be saying there. So what we have here is a slip from, put it in very plain language, Christ came to save believers. More is saying Christ came to save everybody. Absolutely contradictory proposition, a total, uh, a total uh, confusion on the, uh, on the point. Suppose, for example, you're out in a craft and the storm comes up suddenly and your craft is overwhelmed by the waves and it is sunk and you're thrown into the water. There are whole dozens of people thrown into raging uh, water in danger of going down with their craft, as Edna and I were once in, in Sirinagar in Kashmir years ago, and we're very remarkably safe. But anyway, suppose a whole batch of people are in the water in surging waves and in great danger, and they, they have by the seashore there, they have uh, lifesavers and so on, and people are panning out there, throwing out the lifesavers. Now, those lifesavers, you'd first of all say, is uh, they're meant to save everybody out there. But if you look a little closer, you realize, no, no, they're meant to save everybody out there who will take hold of them. They don't have any value whatever for anybody who won't take hold of them. If there's anybody out there, for example, who thinks he can make it on his own, and he doesn't want to be humiliated with a suggestion he needs a lifesaver to get to shore, he won't touch it. If for some strange reason somebody out there thinks that lifesaver is not trustworthy and somehow or other might suck him down, when it goes down, he won't touch it. If somebody happens to see you being the one who's throwing it out and he doesn't like you, and frankly he'd rather drown than be saved by you, he won't touch it. That lifesaver is sent for one group of people, namely people who will take hold of it. And it'll save them. But that's exactly the analogy that we have with Jesus Christ. He is offered to everybody. He is infinitely sufficient for everybody. And anybody, absolutely anybody, even the committer of the unpardonable sin is no exception to this, anybody who will accept Jesus Christ will most certainly be saved. Let me repeat that again, lest any of you ever get the impression that John Owen or John Gerstner or anybody else who says as the Bible does, that Jesus Christ came to save the elect and not everybody, denies that the gospel is offered to everybody, or denies that anybody would be lost who really accepted it. And so on. I repeat once again, Christ is offered to everybody and without a solitary exception, John, I can see your mind clouding up a little bit, without a solitary <laughs> exception, even the person who's committed the unpardonable sin, anybody who accepts the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Anybody. Is that very clear now? Yeah. Well, you weren't puzzled by the, that at all. You understand the answer to that, do you? Why, even the, there's no exception, even in the unpardonable, the person who's committed the unpardonable sin? You all get that? Christ says about that person, you know, that he who's committed that sin, there, there's no forgiveness for him either in this world or in the world to come. You ship something. Here I'm trying to give you a problem where you don't feel one, so I'm going to make, make you a little bit uncomfortable in Zion here. How can I say that anybody, including the unpardon uh, committer of the unpardonable sin, for whom there's no forgiveness in, even in this world, anybody who accepts Jesus Christ will most certainly be saved? You see the problem? Don't you see the problem? You see the problem. What's the answer to the problem? You don't see the problem yet, John, huh? Well, uh, what I would say is, is that uh, they will never come to believe him. That's because exactly Because God right. is the one that gives the belief in the Christ. That's right. But if they did, exactly. if they did, they would be saved. The committer of the unpardonable sin, if you knew who he was or who she was or who they were or something, you would know full well they never would. But I'm simply saying if anybody ever accepted Jesus Christ, including the committer of the unpardonable sin, he would be saved. But as you say, he never will. You know that about him. And God knows that about millions of people. We would know that only about the un committer of the unpardonable sin. But Christ did not come to save everybody, but only those who would actually reach out and accept him. But anybody, 
at any place, at any time, whoever reaches out even to touch the hem of his garment will be instantly and perfectly saved uh, forever. But what Christ did was come to save everybody who would accept his salvation. I was reading this morning as I was pondering this passage, this uh, fascinating episode that uh, uh, is told in chapter 9 of John's Gospel about Jesus and the man born blind. And of course, because I was thinking of this theme, I was thinking of the way that was related to him. Remember, it talks about this person who was born blind, been blind for many, many years, and uh, Jesus came and healed him by putting spittle on his, uh, on his eyes. And then he was told to go to the pool of Siloam. And he came back uh, seeing. And then, he, and then he got into real trouble with a synagogue because this particular cure of this man born blind had been performed, you remember, on the Sabbath day. And as the story goes on, uh, he's uh, investigated by the synagogal authorities there, and the man says, I don't know who this was. His name is Jesus, and I know he made, made me see who was born blind and never have seen in my uh, life. And then they interrogated, these investigators did, they interrogated his parents, who said, yes, it was Jesus, and yes, this was our son, and yes, he was born blind. And uh, but as for who Jesus is, well, he's of age, ask him. They were afraid because these people were breathing down their back. And so they came back, these authorities did, they came back to this man born blind and uh, asked him, and he said, yes, has anybody ever heard of, uh, he must be a good man, of course, because anybody heard of God helping a, uh, a wicked person cure a man born blind? And then he started to taunt the authorities a little bit about whether their curiosity indicated they were getting interested in Jesus, and they dismissed him, excommunicated him from the synagogue peremptorily at that point saying we are follow you can be a disciple of jesus we are disciples of moses and jesus had already said in the gospel you remember the person who is going to condemn you unbelieving jews is not i but moses if you really were following moses you would come to me you call yourselves the children of abraham and abraham rejoiced to see my day that was just an aside the point is here was a person who was healed by the messiah put out of the synagogue for confessing the Messiah. But this is the reason I mention this story, especially as it's relevant to this, is the way it ends. I won't even take time to read it, but what Jesus is saying here to these people who are so superior to this incredulous person who thinks that Jesus healed him and was a true Messiah and such things as that, that Jesus said, they say to Jesus at one juncture, you think we're blind too? And Christ's remark is, if, if you knew you were blind, you would see. It's because you think you see that you're blind. Now, the real drama of this is, this is the interesting thing about the miracles of Jesus. They're performed in the external world, very visible, very impressive, and very undeniable. But they carry with them a much more subtle and invisible uh, significance. And here, I think the significance is that this man who was literally blind and was instantaneously cured so that he was seeing was also inwardly seeing. He was perceiving that he was not merely healed, but that the healer was indeed the Son of Man, the Son of God. These other people who were so sure they knew all about the Messiah and were absolutely certain that this Jesus was not he, they knew so much better than this blind man who was really seeing. They were truly blind precisely because they thought they did see. Now here's Jesus, as it were. He's coming to blind people. He is going to make our eyes open. And if there's anyone in this room who sees, it's in spite of the fact that he was born spiritually blind and was absolutely blind till the moment his eyes were opened, and his eyes were opened by only one person, namely the divine Son of God. And when that person's eyes are opened, and the Son of God comes to him and says, Do you believe in me? Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he says, Just tell me who he is. 